Alright guys, this is going to be video 1 for April 22nd. This will be our first video into period 3, which is the unit uh, course guidebook unit 6 and 7. Um, picking up after Napoleon and the Cor Congress of Vienna and all that. Um, let me get this pulled up. Alright, so looking at restoration and revolution. Let me rearrange this, get this zoomed in a little bit. Following the final, final fall of Napoleon in 1815, the restoration of the Bourbons to the throne in France, the rulers of Europe were faced with a daunting task. We were restoring stability to the relationships between the nations of Europe while also ensuring that the specter of revolution did not reappear, within their, reappear again. To aid in this task, one aspect of Napoleon's reign was widely copied throughout Europe, France's efficiency in controlling its population. In the period following the Napoleonic War, states created larger and more efficient bureaucracies, secret police forces, and more effective censorship, more efficient censorship offices uh, came into effect. In a development uh, in a under, undeveloped nations such as Russia, these oppressive institutions were the only well-functioning part of the state. States used another strategy to turn back the clock, attacking the legacy of Enlightenment. No institution had suffered as much from the Enlightenment and the French Revolution as the Church. The German Romantic poet uh, Novalis wrote in 1799, Catholicism was almost always uh, almost played out. The old papacy is laid in the tomb, and the Rome for the second time has become a ruin. Despite this prediction, Churches of Europe, both Catholic and Protestant, witnessed a remarkable recovery in the Restoration period of 1815-1830. States viewed religion as a useful tool to aid in their repression. In England, the American clergy worked in the House of Lords to block parliamentary measures such as a bill in favor of Catholic emancipation and the Great Reform Bill. In Russia, the Orthodox clergy remained a bulwark of the reactionary policies of the state. The same was true of the Catholic lands such as Spain, where the Inquisition was once again allowed to operate following the disappearance its disappearance during the Napoleonic Dominion of Spain. All right, an age competing ideologies. This is all the isms that compete against each other in this time period. Versus conservatism. Modern conservatism, conser conservatism is rooted in the writings of Edmund Burke, whose reflections on the revolution in France was widely read through Europe. Two components of Burke's work were extremely popular in the re Restoration period. His attack on the principle of the rights of man and natural law as fundamentally, da fundamentally dangerous to the social order and his emphasis on the role of the tradition as a basic under, underpinning for the rights of those in positions of authority. Burke, a member of the English uh, House of Commons, proposed a con con conser con conservatism that was not reactionary in nature. He believed that in the possibility of a slow political change over the passage of time. On the continent, however, a more extreme form of reactionary conservatism appeared in the writings of such men as Joseph de Maister, an uh, immigrant, one of the guys who fled during the French Revolution. The Church argued, uh, de Maester, that should stand as the very foundation of society because all political authorities stem from God. De Maester advocated that monarchs should be extremely stern with those who advocated uh, even the slightest degree of political reform, and the first servant of the crown should be the executioner. Nationalism. Nationalism is based on the idea that all people's identities are uh, de defined by their connection with the na nation, that it's to this nation they owe their primary loyalty as opposed to their king or local lord. The roots of nationalism date back to the early modern period. However, nationalism emerged as an important ideology during the French Revolution. At this time, developments like the National Conscription, the calling of all, all young men for military service, helped create the idea of citizen, citizen who primarily primary loyalty lies not to a village or a province, but to the nation instead. Nationalism became important to other parts of Europe in reaction to the expansion of France. In the German and Italian states, the desire to rid their lands of French soldiers created a unifying purpose that helped establish a national identity. This growing national identity also had a literary component. Writers such as the Grimm brothers recorded old German folk tales to, re to reveal a traditional German national spirit that was part of the common past. Whether one lived in uh, Bavaria, Bavaria, Saxony, or any other German states, early 19th century nationalism was often, though not exclusively, tied to liberalism because many nationalists, like the liberals, wanted political equality and human freedom to serve as the bedrock of the, for the new state. Liberalism. The foundations for the 19th century liberalism can be found in the writings of the philosophers and Enlightenment, with their emphasis on the individual's natural rights and support for limits on political authorities through the writing of constitutions and the formation of parliamentary bodies. Liberalism was, often, was also connected to the events of early stages of the French Revolution with the establishment of the constitutional monarchy, and with Lafayette's Declaration of Rights of Man serving as a basic foundational document. Liberals hoped to protect the rights of individuals by limiting the power of the state and emphasizing the individual's right to enjoy religious freedom, freedom of the press, and equality under the law. 
Besides being a political theory, liberalism was also a school of economic thought. The most important of the early liberal econo economists, individuals who collectively form what became known as the cl classical school, was Adam Smith, who published the most important work in inquiry into the uh, nature and wealth and causes of wealth of nations. Mercantilism held that nations' wealth could be measured only in gold and reserve gold reserves, and that foreign trade would necessarily hurt one side or the other. However, Smith realized that true nation's wealth was the goods produced by the, by the labor of the citizens. Smith introduced two revolutionary ideas. First, specialists, whether individuals or countries, had have natural skills and can produce their special specialties better and faster than others. Trade could thus enrich everyone. France and Scotland would uh, both be richer if they traded wine and coal, rather than the French mining in the vineyards and the Scots growing grapes in the highlands. Second, government price fixing was unnecessary and counterproductive. Instead, governments uh, should follow a lazy affair policy and let individual businesses set their own prices and production levels. He argued that individual decisions, as though guided by individual, the invisible hand, would provide a balance between supply and demand, while also providing businesses an incentive to find cheaper ways to produce more goods, lower prices, and increase. Uh, econ economic, well, economics is sometimes referred to as the dismal science because the classical econ economists such as Thomas Malthus and David Ricardo reached conclusions that can only be viewed as deeply depressing. Malthus, a country, country uh, parson, argued in his essay on population that the population was growing at a rate that would eventually outstrip the food supply. Factory owners were pleased to read in Malthus a justification for the payment of miserable wages to their workers because, according to Malthus, if they were better compensated, they'd be more likely to produce more children, ultimately leading to only more misery as increasing numbers of workers competed for fewer jobs and less food. According to Ricardo, the only way factory owners could find an advantage over their competitors was by offering lower wages, resulting in a steady down downward spiral in their earnings. This iron law of wages must also have also pleased factory owners because, once again, their uh, parsimony could be presented as if it was actually essential for the public good. Ironically, Malthus and Ricardo were both writing at a time when the dramatic expansion of production brought on by the Industrial Revolution was making their negative predictions obsolete. Some writers, although we still have to apply them to the label of liberal, began to question certain classical liberal orthodoxies on the writings of the economy as well as the role of the state. John Stuart Mill began as a disciple of Jeremy Bentham, who had provided a justification for the expanded role of government by suggesting that governments should seek to provide the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Bentham's views, which are given the label of, of utilitarianism, were taken further by Mill, who wrote in his Principles of Political Economy that it may be necessary for the state to intervene and help workers achieve economic justice. In some of Mill's later works, he began to move into a direction that brought him ever closer to socialism. With his questioning of the absolute right to hold private property, while also suggesting that there needs, needed to be a more equitable way for societies to distribute their wealth. Mill's most famous work on liberty was a, a clarion call for personal freedom. Although in the past, the struggle for liberty involved placing constraints on monarchs. In Mill's day, the da danger was that in democratic governments, the majority could deny liberty to the minority, thus squashing the personal liberty that Mill cherished in the name of majority, majority rule. Unlike other male liberals who saw political liberty solely as the male domain, Mill was greatly influenced by the feminist thought of his wife, Harriet Taylor. Inspired by her, he wrote on the subjugation of women, arguing in favor of granting full equality to women. Uh, socialism. Socialism, like other ideologies discussed above, were also partially rooted in French Revolution. A number of the radical Jacobins took the idea of political equality for all and moved it to the next steps, economic equality for all through the common ownership of all property. The early socialist writers are sometimes given the label utopian socialists, a phrase coined by Karl Marx, who viewed these early writers with contempt because he felt they offered non-scientific, unrealistic solutions to the problems of modern society. Utopian socialists believed that the expansive possibilities were available to mankind and that poor environments corrupted human nature. The utopians also believed that the capitalism overemphasized production, underemphasized distribution, and possessed over serious flaws such as Unemployment and the suffering brought about by low wages. So we'll stop video one.